while we have God's word in front of us, let's just bow our heads and come to him in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we are on holy ground. This is your word. This is your perfect, infallible, inerrant word. You spoke it first. You revealed it to your servants and they've recorded it. Therefore, we can know, Lord, that this is the truth. We can trust each word in our Bibles because it comes from you. Help us tonight, Lord, to see your heart behind these words. Help us to see your intentions behind these words. Help us to put away all our worldly and sometimes selfishly presuppositions to hear you speak perfectly and plainly. Help us to understand, Lord, so that we can live and be a church um, and function as a church, as believers in a church who take your word very, very seriously and who wants to build on it and it alone. Thank you, Father, that we can trust you in this. In Jesus' name. Amen. 1 Timothy 2, verse 11. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But women will be saved through childbearing and they if they continue in faith, love and holiness with propriety. So far, the reading of God's word. Now I'm going to spend a lot of time tonight on the background of 1 Timothy. Because this passage has been taken out of the Ephesian context a lot and used by many for their own understandings of this passage. When you, when you have a garden, or if you have a garden, you will understand this. If you see something wrong with your plants, like or fruit or vegetables, the first thing you go to is the soil. You sort out the pests, you go to the soil to see if the soil is healthy or to see if there's something wrong with the soil so that you can add something if there's a shortage of some chemical. But many times when I couldn't find the problem with a plant or a little tree that I've planted and I dig it up, I find that there was something wrong with the soil. And therefore it didn't produce good fruit or fruit at all. Now the plants, the believers in the church of Ephesus, we know by now, did not produce good fruit. They did not produce God-glorifying food. Just the opposite. A few words should ring by now in your ears about quarreling and strife and malicious talk. It is therefore wise for us to, let's say, till the soil to get a better understanding for Paul's words in 1 Timothy 2, verse um, 11 to 15. To see what was underneath, what was in the soil that caused all this bad fruit. So, for us to till the soil means to go back to the context and we are going to spend much time on this tonight which is why the sermon will only be about one verse we, we cannot go into every detail because we are setting ourselves up for the whole passage next Sunday evening but here's the first spit into the soil the historical context of 1 Timothy the first thing we will look at 
under historical context is something that I've mentioned already. The new Roman woman. Now, that's not a term that existed in Paul's time. It's historians that look back to a certain time period in the Roman Empire and coined this term because of the behavior of women during that time in, in the existence of the empire. Now, around 44 BC, um, in, Roman, in Rome, a law was given who gave women increasing economic freedom. Wives gained economic independence and financial security they had not had before. For example, they could terminate their marriage, they could do it by themselves, and they could even receive back a portion, if not their whole dowry, which was unheard of. This was 44 BC. But part of this was also that women experienced new social freedoms, sometimes in very inappropriate ways. They sought sexual freedoms and indulgences, previously, if I could say it this way, reserved for men. So what started out as a good thing, developed into what historians call today the new Roman woman, characterized by immodesty, sexual provocative dress, and a promiscuous lifestyle. Fearing the destabilization of the Roman household, Caesar Augustus, yes, he did things right, and good things for the, for the empire, Caesar Augustus passed a law against the new Roman woman, against these practices. Listen to a few things that he put in place. He put in place incentives for bachelors to get married. Wouldn't you like that, Kundai? being paid by the government to get married. He put in place disincentives for remaining single. Woo! Some people will have a problem with that. The monthly budget will not make it. He put in place punishment, uh, punishments for husbands who ignored their wives' extramarital affairs. And he made promiscuity a public crime. That was not all that Caesar Augustus did. He also prescribed dress codes for respectable women. And quickly, Roman jurisprudence distinguished between the traditional modest wife and the so-called new Roman woman by means of appearance. For women in, in the first century Roman Empire, you were what you wore. Now we know why Paul had to address the dress issue in the Ephesian church. Not only was this new Roman woman lavish in her dress, she was also very outspoken. So she had these social freedoms as well, served on boards, as magistrates even. She could be both brash and bold in public settings and meetings. And no wonder Paul had to remind women to be quiet in the church. Apart from the new Roman woman, still part of the historical context that I've also mentioned, but not, I haven't dug into it so deeply, is the cult of Artemis. That was the goddess of the Ephesians. And they loved her, they adored her. In ancient Greek mythology, Artemis is the goddess of the hunt, the wilderness, wild animals, nature, vegetation, but also childbirth, care of children, and chastity. She was seen as a child-nurturing deity. She was seen as the patron and protector of young children, especially young girls. Artemis was worshipped as one of the primary goddesses of childbirth and midwifery. And she was worshipped by the woman for that, as the goddess who would help women to survive childbirth. 
So Paul had to remind the woman in the church of Ephesus that, that their faith in Christ is what will keep them safe in situations like that. Apart from that, Artemis was also one of the three major unmarried Greek virgin goddesses. And no wonder Paul had to pick up on that because there were some people who were promoting that. In chapter 4 verse 3, we read that there were people who orders the others to, uh, to abstain from marriage, to not marry. These were all part of the soil in which the church was planted. But that was not all. There were not only Gentile, Gentiles in that church. There were Jewish people in that church as well, which meant Jewish ladies. And it's good to, understand, good to get our spade into that soil as well, because this will give us a good understanding of why certain things was addressed by Paul. The second spit into the soil is Jewish women in the synagogues and the early churches. Now Paul preached in a synagogue during his second visit to Ephesus, but there were some Jews who became obstinate, we read, and in the end he took some Jews with him um, and moved to the lecture hall of Tyrannus for about two years. Therefore we cannot ignore the Jewish contingent of women in the Ephesian church. Now today, public worship can take place in a synagogue only if at least 10 adult males are present. Today, women are separated from men within the synagogue, either on the balcony or with a curtain or a wall between the men and the women. Here's the thing, it was not like that in Jesus' and Paul's day. There's no proof from history that it, that, that was the case. There was no separation of sexes in the synagogues then. And women were counted as part of the ten individuals required to form a quorum for a meeting in the synagogue. Which meant that women were much more active in the religious life of her family and her community back then. Women even participated in regular study sessions in synagogues. They sit, sat at the feet of rabbis and were taught alongside men. Just think of Jesus' meetings and how many women came forward to ask him questions or talk to him. Just think of Mary, the sister of Lazarus, who sat at his feet while the sister was preparing food when he was busy teaching. Think of Mary of Bethany, who washed Jesus' feet. She was there while he was busy teaching. Now, because of these familiar synagogue practices, it was just a logical step that when the first churches met, they met on that format. Christian women were part of the congregation. They sat with their men, maybe next to their husbands even, or their fathers when they were, when they were little, during church services. A Jewish woman, for example, in a Christian church was not frowned upon, or even in a synagogue back then, when she asked questions during a study session. In 1 Timothy 2 verses 11 and 12, part of the passage that we focus on tonight, we get confirmation that women were indeed present with men when they met for teaching. We, at this, in the same chapter, we have discovered that they also were there when they participated in prayer meetings. Because what Paul said about prayer for the men, he had in mind for the women as well. If you read in verse 8, I want men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. And then he starts verse 9 with, I also want the woman. They were part of that practice in the church of prayer. They were part of the congregation, men and women, who sat under the teaching of the leaders of the church who learned in the church. Now why would Paul then say something like a woman should learn in quietness and full submission? Did he have it in for women? Was he putting together a male-dominated 
church society. There are a few things. This is the third spit into the soil that we should that we should take a look at. Paul's view on female participation in the church. We need to understand this. The question is, was Paul against women then participating in worship services? Definitely not. Paul was a firm believer in male and female equality in Christ. That's why we have Galatians 3 verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave or free, male or female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. The one is not more important than the other. Whether you're culturally a Jew, that doesn't mean that you're more important or you have some other advantages in the church that others don't have. Or a slave or free or a male or a female. So Paul was no male chauvinist. Paul was without a question a believer in women's ministry as well. Just do yourself a favor and go and read Romans 16 later this week. Or tonight if you want to. Make a note of that. Go and read Romans 16 and there you will see that he commended Phoebe, a deacon, for her faithful ministry, referring to her as his helper. He refers to the famous wife-husband team of Priscilla and Aquila as his fellow workers, both of them. He mentioned Junia, who played a leading role in the church who met in a home. So why then did Paul write to Timothy that women should be quiet and submit in church? We need to understand something about Paul's overarching purpose for writing this letter as well. Go with me to 1 Timothy 3, the next chapter, verse 15. Well, we can start reading from verse 14. Although I hope to come to you soon, speaking to Timothy, I am writing to you with these instructions so that if I am delayed, yes, it, here it is, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. That was his overarching purpose for writing this letter. And throughout the letter we pick up clues confirming that a church meeting in Ephesus, let's put it mildly, was quite challenging. If we listen to the words of Paul, uh, the words that Paul used uses to describe what happened in the church, we get a good picture of it. He used words like controversial speculations, meaningless talk, hypocritical liars preaching, godless myths, old wives' tales were taught, controversies, quarrels, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicions, constant friction, and you get there and you wonder where's the fruit of the Holy Spirit? What's wrong with this plant? So no wonder Paul wrote to Timothy giving him guidance here in chapter 2 on prayer meetings, on women's dress and their behavior and their participation in the church. And when you get to chapter 3, he gives uh, uh, Timothy a list of the qualifications for deacons and elders of how they should order God's household. I mean, and later on we read that Paul speaks about how to treat widows and, and, and how to be a widow and how to treat elderly, the elderly and, and slaves as Christians, in, specifically in chapter 5. And even in chapter 6, how to view and handle money in a God-glorifying way. Paul's letter was all about giving Timothy some advice about how to conduct an orderly worship in the church of Ephesus. It was all about bringing order to the church. Now in verse 11, he addressed disorderly behavior among the women. He already spoke to the men in verse 8, who prayed hypocritical pairs, who brought their anger and their, and their strife to church, and then put up a holy face for prayer. He already addressed the immodest dress of the women, telling them to Rather, be, make themselves beautiful with good deeds for Christ. And now he addresses women sitting in church and instead of learning, doing anything but it. And he says in verse 11 to Timothy, A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. 
Now the soil has been tilled. We have some understanding of what the church in Ephesus faced and who the people were when they came out of that society, what they were exposed to. The new Roman woman, we've heard about the Artemis cult, and we've, we've heard about the Jewish woman and, and her freedom in the synagogue. And uh, It must have influenced the way that the ladies dressed and the way the ladies behaved in that church. So Paul said, Timothy, a woman should learn in quietness and full submission. Let's begin with the first phrase of that sentence. A woman should learn in the church. That doesn't mean men should not. <laughs> He's pointing out, out the primary focus of why, one of the primary focuses of why we get together as God's people around God's word. It is to learn. And he said that focus should be the same for the woman. Some women were either asserting themselves very loudly, very strongly, coming from that new Roman woman influence, or they were there for everything else but to learn the Word of God, showing off their fashion, showing off their hairstyles, showing off their nice necklaces, and the position that their husband had in society. All but learning. All but being equipped with God's word. So Paul wanted no woman to neglect this core aspect of corporate worship. Now this was something specific in that church. So when I say woman in this case, that was really the case in the church of Ephesus. But the principle goes for all of us. We meet to learn it's one of the core reasons why we come together, is to be taught God's word. And for the ladies in Ephesus, to have that focus and not be consumed with their looks or with the advancement of the new Roman woman in the local church, or to have their say in a very assertive way. Paul's intent behind this sentence is, especially that first part, that women should attend church, first of all, because they are disciples. They are learners of God's word, just as men are learners of God's word. For a woman to worship meaningfully, just as for a man, she must take her place as a learner of the faith. I must point out that the English phrase a woman should learn is an um, indicative declaration. It means it, it shows that women should do this generally, women should learn generally. But in Greek it is a third person singular imperative. It, it's focused on the third person. It reads something like let a woman learn. A third party is charged with a command to see to it that this happened. And the third party in this case was the recipient of this letter. First of all, Timothy. He had to see that this happened in the church. See to it that women had the opportunity to learn. See to it that learning really happened and that the focus is on learning and not on all the other worldly stuff. The sense of Paul's command to Timothy here is, Timothy, my son in the faith, see to it that women who attend the church learn. A woman should learn in quietness. Now this has got nothing to do with the bubbly personality of a lady of a, or a woman. Or that women generally speak more than men. I don't know, some, somebody some time back uh, wrote something about a man should speak so many words. Or, or not should, a man speaks so many words a week and a woman speaks so many words. And the woman's words were about ten times that of the man. This is not what Paul had in mind with this. When he said a woman should learn in quietness. We have to take the following into consideration. You can think for yourself. 
You cannot learn much from a sermon if you talk all the time. Would you have been able to learn something from tonight's talk, uh, from tonight's sermon, if you had, a, if you chat with one another all the time, ignoring what, what I'm saying here in front? No. Or if you interrupt the pastor all the time to assert your ideas, will learning take place? Or you keep on focusing on material things like your hairstyle instead of listening to the teacher, will learning take place? No. Then there has to be a certain quiet atmosphere for you to listen and learn. Now obviously, some woman in the church of Ephesus, either influenced by that ideal of the new Roman woman or the Artemis cult or even the false teachers in the church, um, some of them were disturbing this ideal ambience for learning. Understanding how Jewish women were used to asking questions during a, a sermon session, understanding that the Artemis cult was really into feminism and uh, they saw females more important than men, understanding that this new Roman woman ideal was to lift up women and make them important, and some abused that. Understanding all of that, it seems that Paul was telling them, you have to tone that down so that you can listen and learn. Paul therefore urged Timothy to see that the woman too learn in quietness. Now the, the Greek word translated as quietness in the NIV um, is basically the, the word silence, learn in silence. But to, to get a good idea of the tone behind this word and a good sense of its meaning, we can go back to chapter 2, uh, in chapter 2, uh, verses 1 and 2, because that was same word, the same Greek word, esuchia, was also used there. Chapter 2, verse 1, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, in authority that we may live peaceful and quiet lives. The same word. The same word that is translated as quietness, it's the same word that we have there, quiet. In quiet lives, in all godliness and holiness. Which means that quiet has got nothing to do about keeping silent, saying nothing. In, it, it has to do with being, being peaceful, being at peace, being content, being focused on God, being obedient to God. In, in that sense, a quiet atmosphere. A peaceful atmosphere, in, Paul, in Paul's case, so that learning could take place. So it's not about an absolute silence or a quiet and peaceful life. It's not about total silence. It's a life that is content and at peace, focused on God and obedient to Him. Paul told Timothy, see that that happens. You can just, in our context, think, I mean... How can you learn if there's constant chatting? I already used that example. Or in the woman, the, among the women in, in Paul's time when they came to church, and I've seen this with my own eyes, to exchange some recipes. So you have this one with the latest falafel recipe, and you have that one with the latest lamb shank uh, recipe, and so on. And focusing on all the wrong things, except God's Word, and to be taught God's Word. Or oh, when people come into days set up and come to church and they're constantly on their phone, have something in their ears to listen to music while you are preaching, texting somebody while you are preaching, scrolling through their Facebook page to get the latest updates, or even playing a game on your phone. The same principle. You are here to learn, men and women. In Paul's time, the women in, in, in Ephesus, they came for those wrong reasons and missed the purpose for getting together as a people of God. So Paul's call was for Timothy to see that there was an atmosphere of peace, of quiet, among the women so that maximum learning could take place. 
Women should learn in quietness and full submission. The temptation is to read into these words a patriarchal command for every woman to submit fully to any man, and some do that. But if our exegesis thus far is on the right track, then Paul has in mind each woman's worshipful learning in an orderly, orderly, sorry, orderly way. And not a suppression or and much less denigration. The submission Paul had in mind here had nothing to do with submitting to men in general. Let me explain something. Uh, we already looked, when we were tilling the soil, we looked at this synagogal um, way of doing that flowed over into the first church services as well. In early church or Christian congregations, following these Jewish synagogue practices, it was permissible and customary and even encouraged to ask questions during the sermons. There's a whole category of Jewish literature called Yelam De Na Nurabenu, which means, may our, you hear the word Rabbi, which means, may our teacher, Rabbi, instruct us. And some would even come and just sit on the chair there and people would start asking questions. That, that's similar to what we know as Q&A. It happened in the synagogues. Now, Jewish women were used to this. For the Gentile woman who grew up in this new Roman woman era or the Artemis cult of Ephesus, this was mostly a newbie and a green light to assert themselves, to have their say, to ask their questions, um, disrespectfully maybe sometimes, overstepping the boundaries, maybe being... Um, a, taking over, so to speak, to the extent of embarrassing their husbands, we read in the Corinthian church. Here's another chapter that, you, that will be helpful for you to go and read later on this week. 1 Corinthians 14. Because that's where Paul addressed a similar situation in the Corinthian church. Now, we're not going to go through the whole chapter, but it's good to take note of what he told them there, what he said to them there. They had a similar thing with women in the church. Now Paul's advice to the Corinthian church was that they had to see that every activity in the church, in the worship service, and he mentioned it from singing, from teaching, through speaking in different languages, from prophesying, preaching, should be done so that the church be built up. Things should be done orderly so that everyone may be instructed. That's one of the core purposes for us to meet. And encourage. Verse 31. If all spoke at the same time, this was not going to happen. And then in verse 33, 1 Corinthians 14, 33, he reminded them, God is not a God, a God of disorder, but of peace. As in all the congregations of the Lord's people. Therefore, as we meet as the Lord's people, he ends with verse, in verse 40, everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way. And I ask myself, fitting? Wow. Wow. What shall we make with that word? The, the Greek literally means having a good form. It, it refers to uh, a proper or respectable um, attitude and activity. A good word would, to replace the word fitting would be becomingly. So what will help us, women and men, to participate in a worship service in a fitting way, a becoming way? Listen to Paul's overarching reason for writing this letter again there in, in um, 1 Timothy 3 verse 15. How people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. My dear friends, church is about God. We are called God's household. We are called the church of the living God, not of apostles so-and-so, 
of the living God. The fact that the church is not a social club gathering where we just enjoy each other's company and have a nice coffee and cookies from Deborah after service, but God's household meeting together, the people of the living God coming together, that should tell us what the fitting way is to behave when we meet. It's all about God. Everything we do when we meet in His name is according to His purposes for His glory and His praise and to get to know Him. It's all about Him. God is the reason and focus of us meeting together as those who have been saved by Jesus Christ through faith. It's all about and for God. We are together in His presence in a very special way. Therefore, just like there is a fitting way to dress, going back to dress, in the presence of royalty or the president, I mean when the president asks you to come and visit him in his office, you are not going to go in your swimming pants. There is a befitting way to dress when you are in his presence. Because it is him. And here we are together because of God. It must influence at least the way that we dress. And for the woman in Ephesus, that was something very important to hear. Because they dressed immodestly. God is the focus of our meeting. Therefore, we will not dress with a focus or drawing the focus on ourselves. Or our wealth. Because God is the focus, and it's all about Him, and we are meeting in a special way as His people, we need to remind ourselves how we keep quiet when an important person speaks. If you're in the presence of the President, you can't just get on with your chatting and speak as you like. Out of respect, you'll wait till it's your turn to speak. You keep quiet and listen. Therefore, we are, when we are in God's presence in this special way as God's people, we keep quiet and listen and learn. It's not to say we don't chat with one another. We don't, come, we don't take a vow of silence when we come to church. That's not the idea. The idea is be quiet in such a way that we can do what we are here for, which is to worship the Lord, focus on Him, and learn from Him. Therefore, because it's all about God, we are God's household. We are meeting as people of the living God. We need to remind ourselves how we behave properly in the presence of the president. I mean, when you're in the presence of the president, you are not going to tell your best joke. You are not going to do somersaults to impress him. No, you are going to stick to protocol. There's a certain protocol when you meet with the president. You are going to submit to the official rules of engagement and order that has been set out for you. You are going to respect that. And so respect the person in whose presence you are. The same idea with us meeting in a very special way when we come together as God's people. We submit to Him. We submit to the God whom Paul calls the God of order, the God of peace. So we submit to His teaching servant, the one who's speaking in front. Thinking back of, the, of what must have happened in some of those early synagogues where women could ask questions and Gentile women were exposed to this the first time. I can just imagine, especially after they have been saved, they would just go, what, what about this? What about this? What about this? What about this? And all these things. And Paul said, no, no, just wait. There, there, there should be a certain order in God's household. We submit to God by being orderly in our meeting. We submit to Him to hear His servant, His the elder or the pastor or the apostle in Paul's time to preach his word and his will. 
We submit to that order, orderly behavior. We submit to God to listen to His word expounded. And that's the submission Paul had in mind for the woman in Ephesus. It seems as if they were not doing that. But again, that was church specific. The principle is not just for women, because believe me, men can also talk and overpower and be kept, keep themselves busy with all other stuff. But the core purpose for us meeting as God's people, which is to focus on, on Him and be taught about Him through His servant. End of sermon. Cliffhanger. I'm not going to continue with verse 12. I'm going to stop here at this midway point tonight. Because this understanding and looking at some of the background, some of the soil that was underneath the plants of the Ephesus church sets us up for a better understanding of the reason Paul wrote verses 12 to 15 and why that is important for us to know. So, if you want to know how this stage that was set tonight about women that should learn in quietness and full submission, how that serves as a stage for I do not permit women to teach or to assume authority over man's must be quiet, guess what? Come next Sunday evening. <laughs> we are going to look at it then. Let us pray together. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much, Lord, that um, you have made us in your image, men and women. Thank you, Lord, that you have a place for every individual in your church, a function for each individual. You call us members, like members of a body. I pray, Lord, that you will help us to fulfill that, that function that you have in mind for us, and the function that you have, or the abilities that you have blessed us with, to use it for your glory's sake in our church. That you will um, instill a mindset in that we, we will come to church to hear from you, to know more about you, and so worship and adore you in a meaningful way. Thank you that we can ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.